It's the Cooper and Anthony Show. He is a best-selling author, TV personality, and one of our favorite guests. His latest book is Fast Burn, The Power of Negative Energy Balance. That's so provocative. I can't wait to hear about this. He is Dr. Ian Smith. Thank you so much, Ian, for being here tonight. Always good to be with you. It's been a while. Good to see you. I know it has been a while and that's <clears throat> kind of your fault. But anyway, um, <laughs> how many books does this make? 872, 873. <laughs> Where are we at here? That would be nice, actually. 800. Wow, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> Almost like Agatha Christie. Uh, this is book number 20, actually. 20 Whoa. books. Yes. Jeez. Do you have that much to say? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> are you one of those people you. at a party you just don't shut up? You're like, oh, come on. <laughs> oh, here's Ian again at the party. Get everybody no, go I, that way. <laughs> I got to tell you something. Actually, to be honest with you, um, I don't have enough time to write all I want to write. I have so many ideas that I have to prioritize what I can get to right away. I, I could, it's almost like when Prince was doing all that music and they said he had this huge room vault full of recordings. I have so much stuff that I've written or sketched <laughs> out and I'm just one person and I write all my own stuff. So there's only so much I can write. You are the prince of the medical world. I would definitely, that's a really good comparison because that is so who I see you as, like that rock star doctor, you know? So that's perfect. Um, so, you know, you, by the way, we we've seen you over the years, but we first met you in 2006 when you had the fat smash diet. But look at Anthony. He's gained all of his fat smash weight back. So can we right. can we help him? Maybe, <laughs> well, you know, I got to tell you something. Fast burn. This new book is so phenomenal. And I don't say it because it's mine. It's because of the results from the people. I I test drove it uh, on 2000 people in my Facebook group. The average weight loss in nine weeks is 15 to 17 pounds. But beyond the weight loss, and that's a lot of weight, but beyond the weight loss, people are lowering their blood pressure, lowering their blood sugars. Um, their skin is clearing up. They're sleeping better at night. It combines clean eating with intermittent fasting, but it's a realistic approach. So I looked, I wanted to write a book from the standpoint of all those people who say, these are the reasons why I can't diet. So there's alcohol on the program. There's mm -hmm. pasta. There's pizza. There's pancakes. There's steak if you like meat. But I do it in a way that rather than hinder your weight loss, you feel like you're getting enough of the things you like without being deprived, but you're also not overindulging. So it kind of it all works out. What's the concept like? What's the negative energy mm -hmm. aspect to it? Like what? How is what's the twist here? So food is energy and people gain weight when you're in a positive energy state. That means you've consumed more energy than you're actually burning off. We all know that. Right. So that's a positive energy state. When you're in a negative energy state, what that means is your body is still getting energy from food, but it's not getting enough to meet the demands that your body has for energy. So you're now in a negative energy state, which means that your body has to go somewhere else other than food to get the energy. Where does it go? It goes into your fat because fat is a storage form of energy. So rather than using the food for all your energy, you start burning your fat, literally, um, reconfiguring it, melting it down, and reconfiguring so you can use it as energy. So the negative energy balance state goes into your fat. And that's why, by the way, this is of all my programs, most people have said that they have lost seven, eight inches around their midsection because it's fat burning. Is that all age groups? All age groups. I mean, I have people, and I, by the way, those who are listening, um, I have a Facebook group called Fast Burn Challenge. It's free. I'm in the group all the time doing lives. So come to our group, Fast Burn Challenge. I have people from 21 to 77. If I lost wow. seven to eight inches, I'd be negative four. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I'm standing you behind you doing the jerk off motion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to do that. I want you, you have to come out with a book where you can gain seven to eight inches and lose weight. <laughs> and lose weight. <laughs> then that's the book I buy. <laughs> that would be a that would be a multi million copy seller. <laughs> See, I just made you all types of money. There's book number twenty one. <laughs> Uh, now, I, I've become very problematic. I'm going to I'm going to use my opportunity to talk to you since you're right here, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, diagnosed with celiacs this year, which I probably had my whole life because I always had like 
food issues, stomach issues that I was like, hey, it's nothing. I'll be fine. And I never was, you know. Um, so diagnosed with celiac this year, finally. And I'm on the, do you know the low food map or FODMAP diet? Have you heard about this? No, I haven't. Fascinating. So it's from Monash University, which is like the Harvard of Australia. Mm -hmm. And it's only been around for a few years. But for people like me that have IBS and celiacs and all that, it basically is a list of foods you can and can't eat. And they break down the foods into um, fructin, GOS, whatever that is, um, yeah. different categories that you would know. Yeah. And foods that are high in certain things and low in others. Uh -huh. it's, it's weird. Like I can have oranges, but I can't have apples. Uh -huh. I can have bananas when they're not ripe. Once they ripen, I can't have them anymore. So mm -hmm. it's they really it's very technical. I love it, but I found that um, gaining weight on it. You know, I'm I'm trying to bike every single day. I'm doing between 50 minutes and an hour on my bike um, just because I don't. Really, but I don't get a lot of exercise. I don't have a normal day. I work from home, so I'm home are all day. You, are you doing intermittent fasting? Should I? What do I do? Oh, yeah. Oh, There's no way I... she can do fasting. She eats every five minutes. <laughs> well, there... well, well, see, people have a misperception about what IF really is. In IF, you're still going to eat all that food and all those snacks. You're going to have the same amount of food. But the difference is it's when you eat it. So, for example, you take your 24-hour day, you divide it between an eating window and a fasting window. And so let's just say you do what's called a 12-12, 12, 12, 12 hours of fasting, 12 hours of feeding. Here's an example. You start eating at 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. You eat all your meals and all your snacks till 8 p.m. That's your 12-hour eating window. Then from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. is your fasting window. Ooh. You're not allowed to have solid food. You can have as many beverages as you want, up to 50 calories total, okay? And so it's during your fasting period that we go into that negative energy state. And your body starts burning fat for fuel rather than food because there's no more food on board. And so IF is very easy to do. Very, It burns fat, weight loss. It helps inflammation. It's really good. Okay. All right. I'm going to give it a try because I feel like I can do that. Maybe like nine to nine is good for me. Yeah. But, and then what okay. you do is, and then after a couple of weeks, try to get to a 1410. And trust me, it's not bad. In fact, I tell most people, this is how you really start. Don't have anything to eat two hours before going to bed mm -hmm. and don't eat anything two hours after getting up. That's how oh. you start. Two just, hours. Yes. Two hours. So you're basically taking four hours around your sleep and not eating. Hmm. And that's just a slow way to get into intermittent fasting, right? Without being hardcore right away. It's just, right. Because think about it. If you go to sleep at 10 o'clock, mm -hmm. you have your dinner at 745, 740. You're going to sleep at 10. You can have something to drink before you go to sleep. Boom, you're sleeping. So you're knocked out. You wake up in the morning. You may be a little hungry, but a lot of you actually don't like to eat breakfast. So for some people, it's really good. So you wake up in the morning, get something to drink, maybe a cup of coffee if you want, as long as it's less than 50 calories. Okay. And in two hours, then you start eating. It's not hard. Okay. I like that. I feel like I could do this. That feels like something I can easily do as long as I can have my coffee. Here's my main question, and I've been dying to ask you this for so long, and I'm really glad that you're here. Help me understand something. So the diet and exercise industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Billions. And, and you have been helping people get fit and eat healthy for like, what, 15 years more? Something 20. like that? Yeah, 20 like years now. Okay. More. We live in a time now of body positivity where somebody who would be considered medically obese is held up as a role model. And that confuses me because I'm not saying, I, look, I know plenty of people that are larger size and they're super healthy. They work out, all that kind of thing. But not everybody that's obese is fit. But you, but I don't see, I don't understand how the body positivity movement fits into this desire for everybody to be fit and healthy. I know you have an answer to this. It is very tricky. And I am, I have a very simple answer to this. When I talk about obesity and body habitus, that means what your body looks like. When I talk about obesity and body habitus, I talk about it not from an aesthetic standpoint. I only talk about it from a medical standpoint. We have medical facts that say your weight and the way your body is shaped has a direct correlation to your risk for medical illnesses, chronic medical conditions. That's all I care about. So I'm not saying that you should feel bad about the way you look because it says that you're a bad person or you're out of control. No, no. 
I say, I'm concerned about your weight because I know that you have a 40% higher risk of diabetes, a 60% rate higher of hypertension. That's the only way I address it. And I think people have to be very careful about teasing out those points, which is you can be proud of, you can feel proud and not be ashamed of what you look like. But by the same token, you also have to be careful about your disease profile and your risk profile. It's very important. But a lot of that's genetic. Some of that's genetic too. Some of it's genetic, but a lot of it, most of it actually is lifestyle. And so, yes, I believe that we should definitely have body positivity, but that does not mutually exclude you from also wanting to be a healthier weight so that you have less risk for chronic disease and so that you live longer. Right. That makes sense. That's a good answer. Cause I, yeah, I, yeah, I was always mm-hmm. confused about that. I'm like, you're the perfect person to ask about that. And let me say this, and I won't mention any names, but there are several celebrities over the last 10 years I've watched very carefully who were all about body positivity. And they would say, I'm not going to change the way I look. I'm not going to lose weight because this is who I am. And guess what they did? They, they lost, lost weight. The weight. Yeah. Right. They lost weight. So yeah. my thing was like, well, <laughs> You've been sending this message out for all these years, and a lot of people have followed you because of that. Mm. Yet you went and lost 60, 70 pounds. Right. Like, I don't know about that. Right. Mm-hmm. No, there's there's a few celebrities lately that I'm thinking of who have done that at Rebel Wilson and Adele and um Linda Dunham. Yeah. And I and I've always thought about that. I was like, wait, you were the body positivity girls. Um, but maybe, you know, but then then now I'm thinking. Maybe they're also the health girls because there are then there's people like Lizzo out there who's super healthy and she loves her body. And that's just the size that she is. And, you know, we see, I mean, I don't I don't we don't spend know time with her. Healthy. I don't know her, but she seems. But the things that she tells us, it seems like she's super healthy and eats healthy all the time. You know, well, let me so. just say this to you. Your body. And disease. Do not care about your emotions about how you look. So disease, heart Hmm. disease doesn't say, oh, you're proud of the way you look and you're happy. So guess what? We're going to stay away from you. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. Disease says, these are the things that feed us as a disease. And if those things exist, regardless of how positive you are, how nice you are, how well-intentioned you are, disease comes. That's just a medical fact. It's not an opinion. It's not Dr. Ian. These are just medical facts. Right. Oh, that's that really explains it. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. No, that's really cool. Um, last question. I'm not going to talk about your lawsuit because I'm sure everyone's asking you about that and it like yawn. But I do want to say this. I'm so proud of you because as somebody who has been in radio for a very long time, I've seen a lot of unsolicited penises. I mean, more than I want to tell you about. Um, and I even at one point had gone to an attorney after a contract negotiated had fallen apart because I wouldn't give the, the PD a blowjob. And that is a, the God's honest truth that happened. Um, she said to me and she was one of these Park Avenue attorneys. And she said to me, look, you, you have a case here. It's your word against his, but you have a case. And let's say you get what the contract was worth, a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Then what? Then no one in the industry is going to work with you. You're going to be seen as somebody who is litigious and that's going to be it. She said, I'd walk away if I were you. And that's what I did. I never said a word until well, I've talked about it before on the show, but like people know that I've had that experience, but I never did anything about it. And I'm I always think about it. I always think about like all the other girls who came after me who had Mm -hmm. to deal with this predator because women in radio are it's still old school there. It's still a man's world. So when I saw your lawsuit, I was like, ah, oh, I'm so proud of him for speaking up for himself because it's something I don't have the balls to do. Let me just say this and be very simple about it. I have always been a practitioner and a believer of fairness, period. I've always believed that no matter how rich you are, how famous you are, how successful you are, how poor you are, we all go the same way. We all will leave the earth. And what has always been most meaningful to me is to have purpose in my life and to have fairness in my life. I don't care if you're white, black, Asian, Hispanic. I don't, those things, honestly, I think about life, you know, and I'm a really, my family were big into travel and I learned a lot about other cultures. And so what I always want is for people to live the best life they can. 
and to be as happy as they can. Life is tough. Life is just tough in general, okay? Mm -hmm. And even people who you think have it all, they have tough moments in their life. And so I've always been a practitioner of fairness. I'm not perfect, and no one's perfect, but I try every single day to be a good person. And I think that what we have seen in the country recently has been people just not being good people. You know, you and I can disagree, by the way, as much as you want. We can disagree. That, that's great. Disagreements are actually good when you get challenged and you build and, and mend your differences. But but to be miserable and to be mean spirited, that's different. That, that's a whole different ballgame. Right. Right. You right. could say you could say I'm conservative when it comes to fiscal policy. And I could say I'm liberal. I'm liberal. OK, we disagree about fiscal policy. But when you take it to the level of meanness where I am trying to hurt you or I am trying to uh, uh, to call you out personally, that to me is where the country has to back away from because it's not productive. We're just fighting each other and the country suffers as a whole. Right. right? It suffers as a whole. I want you guys, even if you're across the aisle from me, to want the country as a whole to, to rise. That's all I want. Like, you know, if you say, hey, Ian, I believe the country is going to do better by this fiscal policy. I say I think it'll do better by this. But as long as our goal is that we think the country. But if your right. real goal is that you just want you and your cronies to actually be able to benefit, no good. It's no right. good. We, we cannot stand divided. We just absolutely can't. And here's the last thing I want to say about this. I always think about our competitors and the world and them looking at us and they just sit on the sidelines saying this is great these guys are just attacking each other they're mm -hmm. knocking each other think about this they're knocking each other down let's step back let them hurt themselves and they're not exposing their own achilles heels right we got to be smarter yeah we got to be smarter in this country and you know em embrace difference I, I i know it sounds cliche but difference it makes us better we don't want to be homogenous and all think the same way and look the same way. Who wants that? It's right. That's a good point. And, and I think I think that Americans would benefit most from going to see the world. Americans don't travel enough. Mm -hmm. They don't see other cultures. Right. And I, I wrote in one of my books, I wrote the character says uh, he falls in love with this girl. And they talk. He talks about how realizing that night that he gets warmed by the same sun and he gets the light from the same moon that is as loved and shared by people thousands of miles away. They have as much love and ownership of that moon and sun as he does. He no more owns it than they do. And that's the idea is that we all share this stuff mm -hmm. and we have to be more open-minded about it. I mean, and we can't take it with us.